Spectrum Theater Ensemble. And we're on to our next panel, which is Creative Communicators. And I'm gonna hand it over to Anna to introduce it. Awesome, so uh, hi everybody, I'm Anna Zembo. You may have seen me earlier uh, talking about the Miracle Project, but I'm here now as Spectrum's general manager um, for Spectrum Theater Ensemble. And I'm really, really excited to introduce our next guest um, for one of our featured programs. Um, so without further ado, um, welcoming Mark Corallo, who is the program director of Creative Communicators, a New Jersey-based uh, creative arts program for people on the spectrum. So welcome, Mark. Thank you, Anna, so much. Um, again, I really appreciate you guys having me um, and being able to talk about theater arts and how it supports individuals on the spectrum. Um, it's just a huge passion of mine. Um, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to share my screen with you so that I could give you all a PowerPoint presentation and talk about my background and uh, what Creative Communicators is all about and then share a little video with you to show you what our kids are capable of doing along with our vision and mission. Um, but before I do that, I just wanted to um, say that I have been a practicing um, speech language pathologist for over 20 something years and um, prior to that was an actor and just always believed in the integration of the arts and speech language therapy. And um, it's just an, a, an amazing marriage and you can accomplish so many skills and so many goals through the arts. Um, and it's something that we really believe in um, at Creative Communicators. So let me set this up for you and we will get started. Great, can everyone see it? Yep. yep. Okay, Thanks, sure. So as I mentioned, we are creative communicators. We are a 501c3 inclusive arts program for neurodiverse and neurotypical learners. Uh, and we are located in Somerset and East Brunswick, New Jersey. Uh, as I mentioned, I've been a practicing SLP for over 20 years and uh, the work that I specialize in, um, in particular are social skills and running social skill groups, um, routine play-based activities, arts-based social groups and presentation skills and teamwork activities, um, primarily for individuals on the spectrum um, or for other related communication uh, disorders. So what's the vision and mission? So um, to give you a brief story, we started this program. I actually started out working with um, individuals who were deaf and hard of hearing, and that's how I fell into this work. And um, when I was working, as I just began as a, as a speech pathologist, I um, immediately fell in love with the idea of bridging the arts and speech together. And nothing was happening for individuals on the spectrum. And it was at this point that I said, it just makes sense to really support the language, the imagination, the social skills, uh, the motivation, the interest, um, and what the strengths of uh, what strengths they have, and we want to capitalize on that, and that's what's most important. So our vision and our mission is it's, we're an integrated arts-based program, and we combine the principles of speech and language therapy and social skills through theater through dance and through other art mediums for children and adults with autism spectrum and other communication and language needs. And the program goal is to help students develop meaningful peer relations and support their social emotional needs, communication and imagination in a safe and nurturing environment to assist in the development of functional skills needed for them to navigate the world around them. So we are open to all learners. So we do not discriminate. <laughs> um, as far as our intake process is concerned, it's pretty loose. What we do is we really have individuals come in with their families and we meet with them as a group. Um, and what we look at, depending on their level of language capabilities, um, it can go anywhere from a one-on-one -on -one interview to a language-based observation, to discussing family goals and goals that are happening in the school and how we can bridge those goals between the school and the theater program um, and learning about um, the individual's motivation. That's the primary piece that we wanna take away from the assessment is how motivated they are and what they're motivated by. 
And then we're tapping into their skill strength. And then by tapping into their skill strength, we capitalize on what they are because that's what we want them to shine and, uh, and show us uh, throughout our theater arts productions. Um, our program is run by three speech language pathologists. So it's myself and two other SLPs. Um, and we also have an art therapist working with us. And what we may do, depending on the type of learner that comes into the program, some of our students start off in individual speech and language therapy because that's uh, predominantly what they need at that point. But then our goal is to move them from individual therapy into larger groups. So some kids come in and they go right into the theater program. Some kids come in and they might go into smaller arts-based groups or smaller social skill groups because that's what they need. Some may start one-on-one, -on -one, but then eventually we introduce them all into being part of the theater community. And of course, you know, what we do is we take the interests of the children, the adults, the teens, and we develop goals based around those interests. So to give you an example, we had one, um, individual on the spectrum with us who really loved to have conversations specifically about his interests, but really wasn't interested in what others were talking about. And so, but he was super motivated in wanting to be a talk show host. So we created a whole show around him being a talk show host. And the goal that we embedded in the talk show was that he had to initiate and ask questions about other people's interests. And it was, you know, all evolved around him being the lead and he absolutely loved it and he did so amazing. Um, so of course we look at turn taking, we look at um, imitation of movements, conversation, um, comments, giving directions, um, understanding of theory of mind, um, vocabulary, reading and writing, nonverbal communication and voice and articulation. So all of these are speech and language goals that can be embedded into a theater arts program. Um, and again, we do not discriminate. We have siblings, we have school age peers, we have adult volunteers, and we just have such a blast. And we bring everybody in as part of the community who want to help and want to volunteer and want to be a part of our program. Um, so, so far, um, all of the shows have been written by the individuals. So what we do is we collectively take all of their thoughts and then we write a large show around what their thoughts and motivators are. Um, so we might have some kids who are interested in outer space. Um, so there's, uh, we did one year of social skills in space, um, but then we incorporated um, all of the different motivations under the general theme of social skills in space. Um, we just did our latest show, which you'll see in the video, which is um, Creative Communicators Got Talent. We actually ran it twice. Um, and in this particular show, it gets to each, each individual gets to um, demonstrate what their skill strength is. And we made it like a, a, you know, an America's Got Talent and they had such a blast. So again, we're located um, in Somerset, New Jersey and in East Brunswick. And um, if you'd like to email me, um, or any of us uh, for any information on the program, our email is speechonstage at gmail.com. And our website is creativecommunicators.net. And I'm gonna take you through the uh, video. Um, some of our uh, YouTube uh, mentions are ABC. We were featured on Be Kind, uh, a Be Kind campaign from ABC. And we're also on YouTube. Um, so if you type in East Brunswick Television, and there's a typo there, my apologies, <laughs> at Creative Communicators, you can uh, check us out on YouTube. And uh, I'm going to play for you now our video. Um, just to take us through a little bit of the history of, of why we do this, um, we started this about 10 years ago in uh, my private practice in a waiting room with six children. One of them is still with us here tonight, and we did it with a book. And my belief always was that you can teach so many skills through the arts. And we literally put on a small production with about 10 parents in the waiting room and everybody just loved it and we had a blast and 
what we saw was that we were able to really tackle a variety of skills throughout the process. And this included social skills, this included speech and language skills, this included reading, this included development of friendships. And over time, we luckily just grew. And we have about 20 to 25 children that attend our community each week on Saturdays. And each year it's a little different. And what we love about what we do is that we really tap into the interests of the children and we use their strengths to capitalize on, to show you what they are capable of doing. Yeah, that's where, you know, the goal, the, there's a long-term vision as well for creative communicators and those of you who know me and have worked with us for a really long time, um, you know, our goal is just to provide an atmosphere that can provide functional skills for our kids. And that is our long-term vision and what we hope for. And that is our presentation. I'm going to stop screen share and come back to you guys. And um, that is Creative Communicators. Awesome. Thanks so much for sharing that, Mark. It was great to learn a little bit more about what you do. Um, I know I, I think we have a lot in common. I am also a speech therapist. So it's awesome to see other uh, practitioners integrating, you know, creative, creative mediums for, um, for therapeutic intervention. So I've got some questions for you. Dan and I um, have some questions for you. And the, the first that came to mind um, while you were speaking, you talk a lot about how, um, you know, through your knowledge as a speech therapist and on the creative side, you're able to integrate lots of goals and objectives and really, you know, work on skills, skill building um, for your kids. And so I'm wondering if you can talk about just some of the benefits that you've seen, um, you know, either in your groups or in individuals, um, either in, you know, little achievements of objectives or larger, uh, larger functional outcomes? Absolutely. And a great question. Um, I think a lot of the times what, what I experienced, you know, first off being a therapist in the school was, and I think teachers experience this. I think parents experience this. I think a lot of it is, you know, generalization of skills. And when I was working a lot of the time, I was working, you know, at a table doing one-to-one -one intervention. And I, I loved the work that I was doing, but I was always thinking about how I could really uh, tackle the skills in a much more natural environment. And, you know, I think we all learn at our most 
maximum when we are highly motivated and having fun. And I think that's what it's really all about. And, you know, one of the things that I've gotten back from parents, um, there's this one particular girl uh, that comes to my mind who was in the program. And, you know, she demonstrated some behaviors when she started and she was very rigid and she did, if there was any sort of change in the programming whatsoever, she had severe anxiety and there would be meltdowns. And so what we worked on in the program with her was we would sort of prime her and say, okay, next week when you come to the theater program, we're going to make this a little different. All right. So we want you to be prepared for that. And her mom was just so thrilled with the fact that she was able to tolerate change over time without having a meltdown and having changes in her routine that she was so bought into the process. And that's really where I think um, that's what it's more about. The arts is what, is what sort of drives the motivation and drives the fun, but then you target the individual needs for each uh, student that's part of that program. Um, I have other children who have come in who um, were not speaking as much, who didn't have as many words in their vocabulary. And parents were saying, well, we saw increases in their requesting skills or they're communicating more. Um, so it's been really great to see some of those um, uh, goals that have, you know, been developed throughout the process. That's great. That's great to hear. So, um, hi, Mark. I'm Dan Boyle. Um, Pleasure, Dan. Um, I'm a person on the spectrum and also very much a, a member of the leadership team of Spectrum Theater. So I, I know that as a group that does this sort of work, there will be challenges that you encounter along the way. So my question to you is, my first question to you is, uh, what are some of the challenges that your program has encountered and how have you worked to overcome them? That's right. That's a great question. So one of the one of the issues that we do come across or that we have come across is certainly behaviors. And there are times when parents do want um, the student to enter the theater program right away. And what we have to be realistic about is that, like any program, you need to make sure that you have enough support there to be able to support the individual needs of certain learners. And if that support is not there, then we're not doing anything to support that learner. And so our goal always is to offer something alternative in the event that we do not have what would be in the best interest of that student. So that's where we would go back to either offering individual therapy or offering a small group or you know, working more with um, a particular specialist before they enter the group. The other thing that we do do is if we're not 100% sure, then we offer a trial period and then offer the additional supports if needed. So we have some kids who really come in and surprise us, you know, like a parent might say they're really not motivated, they demonstrate X, Y, and Z behaviors. And I'll say, okay, look, you know, this is a goal that you wanna see for your child. And um, you know what? They are motivated by some of the factors in our program. Why don't we see if the motivation is enough for, um, them to participate and be a part of the program with minimal behaviors. And we do have, have students that have some behaviors, but they are managed, uh, they are able to be managed within the program and with redirection. But if they're more severe, that's when we would um, you know, offer alternatives. So that actually leads me into, gives me an idea about another question that I had jotted down. Um, can you tell us a little bit about how you meet um, meet a diverse set of needs. You know, certainly there are kids who have, you know, it's a diverse population. There's a lot of different needs that might crop up um, and kind of how you guys work as a team to address those. Yeah, so, you know, it's been different each year. And I, you know, I want to say we have a formula, but I don't think <laughs> we do. <laughs> um, I wish I did. Um, each year, I kind of rack my brain as to how to figure that out. What I could say as a therapist is we as a team will, we will target the learners who do need more supports to have that one-on-one -on -one intervention by providing visual supports for communication or, um, or what, how they would best function in the group based on the number of staff members that we have. So for example, um, 
if we have individuals who are, who are minimally verbal, but they love to dance, okay, then what we want to do is then form that dance ensemble, okay? And what we want to do then is embed aspects of communication in that dance ensemble. It might be as simple as one or two communicative skills, but we then embed it into the dance ensemble so that there can be an integration of those skills within something that they're strong in. So if it's easier for them to imitate gross motor movements, if it's easier for them to follow directions, if it's easier for them to uh, verbally express one or two words, then what we might do is something as simple as like, let's say a dance game, where um, there's sort of this back and forth mo movement of like turn taking. So they'll be doing an activity and then the dance stops and then they'll have to say like, turn the music on and then the music will go back on. And so then they're using their language but they are then engaged in a fun activity. So that's one way we would meet the learner's needs. If we have students who are, um, I wanna say have a, a, a higher grasp of, of language, then we sort of facilitate that more and act more like coaches where we're then sort of coming off of the direct teaching model and just facilitating the communication amongst the kids so that we're truly um, fostering interaction amongst each one of them. And then um, we really, they, they kind of look at, they don't look at me as a friend, but they definitely look at, I think because I'm the old guy, but they look at the SLPs as, as friends and who are part of, of um, uh, part of the groups. And so what we do is if, you know, we, the main goal is to drive and to facilitate as much as possible amongst the kids. And then sometimes what we do is we may take kids who do have um, various areas of language that kids who may not have as much language, and we will mix the groups up so that there's peer models amongst, amongst uh, the kids that we do have within the program. Hmm. Awesome. So that, that really kind of leads into a question that I was kind of thinking of. Um, so I know through your video and that you had shown a number of different plays and whatnot. And I was, I was wondering if you, if you could tell us more about the creative process in your program, how you come up with the plays you, you decide to put on and all that, you know? Yeah, that's, uh, <laughs> that's a lot of work. Um, <laughs> so again, I wish there was, it, it's a process. It's always a process. So we, we, it's funny, we'll start off with certain shows where we'll think we'll have the show down and then we're like, oh my God, this is not working. We need to start again. Um, we'll have, you know, we'll have a process where we'll have, um, kids that say they'll want to do one particular topic and then four weeks in they're like no we hate this we want to change it and then so we wind up changing the process um so i what i want to say is is that it's a collective process always around their interests the majority of the time what we do is we sort of make small vignettes out of and and then create one large theme integrating the small vignettes so that all of the interests are always kept. So for example, like we had one girl who was just obsessed with horror movies and she just wanted to be the screamer, okay? So what we would wanna do here is, so let's say we wanna work on flexibility because she was very rigid. So this is an example. So we were like, okay, well, our show, you know, we've all kind of agreed that our show is gonna be social skills and space. Um, there, you know, we could make a horror movement, you know, we could make a horror scene in there with aliens, um, or we can make it where you are the general screamer who gets rid of the aliens. And every time you run across the stage, your powers get rid of the alien, you know? And she was like, oh, I like that. That's what I'll do, you know? So, so it gave her choice and it gave her power of choice. And then she had the option to do what she wanted. So again, it's very, very individualized and, somehow we always manage to pull it off. And, um, you know, we'll stress down to the last minute of thinking we are not gonna make it. And they always surprise us and we always surprise each other. And it winds up being an amazing show every time we do it. Awesome, that's beautiful. And it sounds a lot like an experience that I have had. <laughs> I think a lot of people in, uh, in performing arts in general, neurodiverse or not, can identify with that. Absolutely. 
Yeah. Um, so we've got just a few minutes left, um, and I've been uh, wanting to ask um, a little bit about how you guys in, uh, address inclusion in your program. I know you mentioned yep. that you involve neurotypical peers, siblings, things like that. Mm -hmm. um, but can you talk a little bit about how that works for you guys? Absolutely. So we we um, what we do in terms of inclusion is very similar to how we would offer. Um, organizing peer models within the program in and of themselves. So the, the way that we normally get students or volunteers is it's usually by word of mouth or a sibling's friends. And they'll just say they want to come and they want to volunteer because they want to be a part of it and they have a blast doing it. And we have um, one girl in particular who's been with us and she's nine and she's now 16 and she's just having so much fun. So I would say the, the, the majority of the time it's word of mouth. Um, or, you know, or by schools, because we've had the opportunity to present to schools. And then when, when we have gone in and done our performances for kids, they see how much fun it is, and then they want to be a part of it as well. And, you know, what we also find for, for uh, kids, because in terms of talking about, if you want to say neurotypical, you know, there are kids who we have come across who, um, are in general education, but are struggling with self-esteem or their own anxieties. And this is just such a great way for them also to be part of a safe space and for them to explore and to develop friendships and then to slowly become of the process and you know gain their own confidence. Um, so, and they feel really, really good about empowering others. And we, we often call them the future social workers of America. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. Yeah. Um, and that actually leads me to our last question. Dan, did you want to uh, yeah, throw um, our last question? So yeah, so obviously you have done a lot. You've wow. made plans. You've got a lot of experience. So my question, my last question for you is, what does the future hold for your program? What do you hope to develop as you go along? Such a great question. The long-term vision for the program is really twofold. So one is, is to try to get into many school programs as possible. I, I mean, I can't stress enough the importance of the arts and how you, it's for anyone. I mean, there's just so many goals that can be accomplished through the arts, whether it's self-esteem, whether it's, you know, building imagination, whether it's fostering friendships, whether it's building your confidence, whether it's um, taking on things that you've never taken on before. I mean, our, our goal is to continue to spread the awareness and the messaging of what individuals on the spectrum and other communicative needs are capable of doing through arts-based programming and to spread that awareness really one in schools and to develop more partnerships with schools and community-based agencies and two to have our own center where individuals come for um, speech and language therapy occupational therapy music therapy social skills and theater that's the long-term vision thank you thank you very much beautiful you've gotten a lot of good information out there uh, you've explained your program very well. Thank you very much. You're very welcome. Thank you. Thanks so much, Mark. Quick from you, Anna. Yeah. Um, so we're going to um, throw it back over to Clay, um, who's going to wrap this up and lead us into our next segment. Yeah. All right. Thank you so much, guys. And thank you, Mark, for sharing your amazing program with us. You're very welcome. Thank you, everyone. Have a good day. You too. Um, so we have about... 20 minutes before our next segment. Uh, just to tell you a little about it, um, we decided we were gonna do just a preview reading of one of the 10 minute plays that's being worked on, but the cast and uh, crew decided that it would be a great idea to maybe show a little bit of our process. So at 5, 10 p.m., we'll be doing a sneak peek inside the rehearsal process of our 10 minute play festival uh, with the play Respect by Oscar Cabrera. Um, and his director and cast working together. So um, we'll take a break in just a minute and come back at 5.10. Before we do though, uh, I just wanna say thank you to all the participants that have been able to join us. Uh, SC loves to share these kind of discussions uh, with the community. Um, and we hope that you share it with people that you know uh, and people that you think might be interested both in autism advocacy and uh, autism inclusion in the arts. Um, along with that, uh, 
we do uh, offer this for free to the public, um, but we also at the same time rely on public support for our programming. So if you have uh, the inclination and, and can donate, uh, please look check out our Facebook page and our fundraiser event, as well as our website, www.sdensemble.org, where you can donate via PayPal. Thank you so much, guys, and we'll be 